We come to the third and final part of this particular story arc, Paperclip. There have been many menaces in the X-Files, but none quite compare to Clippy. I think we can all agree there. So we start with Albert continuing to talk about his people. To the Navajo, the Earth and its creatures have great influence over our existence. The stories passed from generation to generation help us to understand the reason for our tears of sadness and tears of joy. Animals like the bear, the spider, and the coyote are powerful symbols to our people. And I tell you that that is still more respectable than Voyager ever was. Suffice to say, a white buffalo was born when Mulder was healed, so they see that as a powerful omen. Which is great for them, but we did end on a cliffhanger, so we should probably get back to that. Scully and Skinner are in a standoff, so the person at the door bursts in, and it's Mulder. Skinner realizes that he's outgunned, so he puts his away and takes out the tape to prove his intentions. And after a bit of arguing, it's agreed that he'll hold on to the tape to keep it out of the hands of the Legion of Doom. But he takes the next elevator so Mulder and Scully can have a chance to grin at each other over their reunion, making so many shippers very happy. Scully's unaware of what happened to her sister. Even her mother thought that it was her that had been shot, not Melissa. But while she is being treated, Scully is working with Mulder and the lone gunman about one of the photos, bringing us to Operation Overcast. If the Navajo Code Talkers represented American patriotism at its finest, of a people who, in most cases, volunteered to serve to fight for the United States despite its deplorable behavior towards them because they nevertheless still believed in that country, and they built up that from what they learned in the last war, while well, Operation Overcast was instead a secret program that many felt betrayed America's values in order to prepare for the next war. The projects the Nazis were developing were making weapons of mass destruction a reality, and the rocket program was a threat to America. The United States was leaps and bounds ahead of the Soviets in terms of air superiority, but rockets would allow them to make up for it. That's why in the space race, the Ruskies were ahead of the United States for much of it. They had more of an incentive to get there. Anyway, though, getting these German scientists was just as much about keeping them out of Soviet hands as it was to have them working for the Western Allies. The only trouble was the disturbing facts. Operation Overcast was an expansion on a simple exercise in studying German weapons and notes to questioning the men themselves. And it was after finding out that a respected German scientist and physician, who had been considered for a Nobel Prize in medicine no less, was now engaging in testing on human subjects from concentration camps. These scientists and their families would now be brought to the U.S. and effectively shielded from any crimes that they had committed, which in some cases were considerable. Getting them in was complicated because the State Department had ruled against that kind of thing, so, to help fit them in more discreetly, the files of scientists who had particularly troubling problems had a paperclip slipped into the file as a signal that they were to be held over until they can get around the pesky rules that were trying to stop them from making arguable war criminals into American citizens. This then led to the program being renamed Operation Paperclip. Well, if that's what you need for the average questionable Nazi, Victor Klemper was the kind who would need a box of paper clips, some staples, and a couple of binder clips to reflect what an evil man he was. Experimented on the Jews, drowned them, suffocated them, put them in pressure chambers, all in the name of science. Together with Von Braun, Klemper helped us win the space race. Operation Paperclip was supposed to have been scrapped in the 1950s, but if this is 1973... Whatever happened to Klemper? He's still here, living very well at the expense of the American taxpayer. That made sending in my tax payment last week really, really hard. And at least it stopped paying for the murder of kittens. That's something I take a little pride in. I no longer subsidize the murder of kittens. What's not a relief, though, is learning about what happened to Scully's sister, and it's all Mulder can do to stop her from rushing to the hospital. But that would only leave her open to assassination if she tried. Though the Society for Evil is currently divided over things right now, with well-manicured man ridiculing the cigarette-smoking man for his assassin's failure and his belief that any problem will go away if you use enough bullets. They are so skeptical by now that they insist on seeing the tape, 
So he says, oh, yes, of course I've got it. Just give me 24 hours to go and find a box to put it in. It's at this point that somebody somewhere seemed to forget that data is not exactly a MacGuffin. Hitchcock's famous term is used to describe the object that drives the narrative, such as the Maltese Falcon, military plans, or special key. There is something intrinsic with the object such that its possession or absence makes all of the difference. If I had the ambassador's case, that means then that no one else has it. A twist might be that I remove what makes the ambassador's case special from it so that people after the case wind up with something useless. But what if I can turn the ambassador's case into 10 identical cases, each one as useful and valuable as the original? Then the story gets more complicated. Unfortunately, with electronic data, you wind up with exactly that. And the old tricks regarding motivations related to the MacGuffin fly out the window. Let's take this as an example. Cigarette smoking man needs to show he has the tape to set the minds of the others at ease. But what's there to stop him from downloading the data that he already has access to onto another tape? Timestamp it if he wants to. Make it match the original. How would they ever know? Right? And that's assuming they even bother to check the thing. Or just wait till what finally happens here. As we go on, enjoy how they struggle to keep up with the idea of new media in this story. Anyway, speaking of things that are funny, Nazi scientists. Mulder and Scully find Klemper. I'm an old man now. History bores me. Because it escaped you? Or because you escaped it? Oh, now you've done it. Now we got to hear about just how hard it is being branded a Nazi scientist. Zal Crick, Watson, these will be the names they celebrate at the end of the millennium. Great scientists. And Klemper? He will be remembered only as a butcher. History may be the only justice you'll ever know. Do you know my work? Do you know what we accomplished? As a Nazi or for the blood money we paid you? Let me preface this by saying... I don't disagree with Scully's sentiments here. If I'm upset about the murder of kittens, you can imagine how I feel about the murder of people. But generally, if I need something from somebody, no matter how mad I am, I usually try to rein in my temper first. I don't walk in there going, Hey, fucktard! You sack of shit, you! No, 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 strike that. I shouldn't have said that. Shit can be turned into something useful, like fertilizer or a bomb. You aren't that. You look like shit, you feel like shit, and you smell like shit, but you're not shit. You're low-cal shit substitute. Filler that people use if they need to stretch out their actual shit to try to show that there's more useful shit here rather than you, a useless shit. Anyway, can you help me move this weekend? Despite this, he tells them where the picture was taken and that they'll find the answers there but then he tells well manicured man what happened, which means that the cabal now knows that Mulder is alive. Albert returns to help out, passing on to Scully's mother that she's all right, and praying over her sister to try to help her get better. Skinner's working on a more direct matter, calling in the cigarette smoking man about the tape. Well, that guy is not happy being jerked around about this and sure as hell doesn't want to make any deals with Skinner. Seems nobody is happy to see Skinner these days. The perils of federal government middle management, I guess. Well, while that drama plays out, Mulder and Scully have found that place. There's a mine there, but access to the tunnels is blocked by a series of doors with electronic locks. They do manage to get one open and find tons and tons of filing cabinets in there full of medical records. Self-destruct activated. You have one minute to reach minimum safe distance. Inside the files is information on smallpox vaccination and a tissue sample case. And sure enough, there's one here for Scully, complete with a brand new modern tissue sample unit to show that it's recent. Knowing that, Mulder rushes around and finds a file on his sister, only peeling back the label reveals it was originally for Mulder. I guess after spending all the money building this place and carrying out the task of getting all of this info, there just wasn't enough money left over for a new file folder. 